Hey everybody, we're going to take a look at the inside of the console of my Carillon today. Uh, as I've said in a couple other videos, this Carillon is actually made up of components from several different systems that I gathered over the course of almost 30 years, but definitely the rarest piece is the console itself. To any organists out there, this console may look familiar even if you've never played an electronic Carillon. That's because it's a Moeller pipe organ console. Schomerk used Moeller to make its consoles for the larger instruments for a number of years, and this one has a little extra special history. This console was connected to the very large Carillon Americana at the Schomerk factory in Sellersville, Pennsylvania. It served as their factory console from the late 1950s until 2004 when it was being discarded. Fortunately, at that time, I knew someone at the factory who tipped me off that this was about to go to a landfill, and if I wanted to rescue it, all I had to do is come and pick it up, which is exactly what I did. Since this was Schulmerich's factory console for many years, it underwent some changes over time, and we'll see some artifacts of those changes when we take a look at the inside. But before we do that, let's look at the features from the outside. First of all, there are two keyboards or manuals. The upper is known as the swell. The lower is the grate. Both of those manuals have five octaves or 61 notes. In addition to the two manuals, we have 32 pedals that allow you to play the bass notes with your feet. Above the pedal board are four expression pedals for the volume levels of different sets of bells. The one on the left is for the harp, celesta, and quadra bells. The next is for minor tiers, and the two on the right are for the Flemish bells, with the bass and treble ranges being under separate expression with a split point at middle C. Above the manuals, there are stop tabs, which allow you to engage sets of bells individually or in combinations. There are groups of stop tabs for the pedal, the swell, and the grate. In addition to the stop tabs, there's a large switch plate with on-off controls for the system itself, for the tower speaker, speaker volumes, and also animations like the tremolando and uh, vibrato, which we'll take a look at a little bit later on. Just a little point of interest, one of those artifacts I mentioned earlier, in both the great and swell divisions, there are tabs marked record C to C and record G to G. I'm not really certain on this, but as far as I can tell, these probably once engaged a roll punching machine because for a long time, Schulmerich used punched rolls for automatic play, and those rolls were punched as a master first and then duplicated as people requested certain tunes. So I believe you used to be able to draw those tabs and record a punched roll. And probably the C to C and G to G ranges had to do with the fact that Schulmerich had roles in different octave configurations for different size systems. Again, that's a lot of speculation on my part, but uh, it's kind of fascinating to see those tabs on there. Even though they don't do anything now, they're a little part of the history of the console. I'm going to take some panels off and we'll have a look inside. So the lid and back are removed and you can see some of the inside. Uh, we're going to get in a little closer and examine the swell manual. I'm going to zoom in so you can get a closer look. There is a contact leaf for each note of the keyboard and those leaves are carried in rails that can move laterally and that's how the different sets of bells are engaged. So each of those lateral strips of contacts that you see represents one set of bells. There's a strip for eight foot Flemish and a strip for four foot minor tiers and so on. And when you engage a stop on the instrument, I'll get over to this end, uh, those large solenoids on the end pull that slider in or out of position to engage all the contacts. Now you'll notice there's also a, a, a rocker bar, which is running vertically from our perspective. It comes directly out from the back of the key, and it's divided in the center by a little plastic insulator. That's the division between the four foot stops, which are on this side, and the eight foot stops on the other side. So they stay electrically separated. And at the front end, the keyboard end, those are the backs of the keys for the swell manual. 
and right above the felts there's a little crank when the key is depressed that crank lifts the rocker arm into position so that it makes contact with the appropriate contacts for that note um, that front rail just behind the keys is a bus and uh, when we take a look at how it works from the other side you'll see that that bus is the last thing that gets engaged so all of the other stops that are drawn all of those contact leaves will make contact first and then the last thing to make contact will be that bus leaf that way all the bells strike at exactly the same time even though there may be slight differences in the adjustment of the individual leaves it's really quite clever all right i'm going to go around to the other side and move the camera over there so we can see how it works all right so here's the view from the keyboard side again i'm on the swell manual and i'll just play a few keys so you can see those rocker arms you can't quite see the back of the key with this angle but the back of the key again is lifting up a little crank that tips that rocker arm so it can make contact and if you look closely you'll see there are a few places where the arm is making contact uh, those are the buses the four foot the bus for the four foot stops and the bus for the eight foot stops the bus for the eight foot stops is this frontmost one and this first rail and right now when I press the keys of course nothing's happening because there are no stops drawn there are no sounds engaged uh, here's the uh, slider for the eight foot Flemish so if I hold a key on and then draw that stop and if I draw additional stops you'll see the sliders move for each of those Now what I mentioned before, if I draw everything I can here in the 8 foot division, if I push it very slowly, I'm going to move this, this is uh, middle C I believe, I'm not looking at the keys, yeah. If I move it very slowly, you're going to see it's going to catch those leaves in the back first. It's already caught some of them right now. And then keep going and eventually it's going to meet that front leaf which allows all those bells to strike at the same time. And that's very useful because, as I said before, if there are little adjustments, you can see those leaves don't all stick up at exactly the same angle. That will take care of the adjustment problems because no contact will be made for all of them until they have all engaged with that rocker arm at their own pace. Uh, now, let's see, the, as I said, that back section is where the eight foot stops are. So if I draw some four foot stops, you'll see some of the sliders in the front section moving too. All right, so that's everything, which is really not the best sound because we have some major and minor tuned uh, bells striking at the same time, but it shows you that all of those things are able to engage together. So that's the stop action, and this same action is duplicated underneath for the grate. Um, I'm going to lift up the manuals actually and give you a shot underneath so you can see the wiring because it's quite amazing to see the wires that come off all of those contact leaves and get gathered together to head back to the uh, junction panel. Here's the grate. Looks very much like the swell, has the same stops little bit longer key fronts but there's the underside of the swell and look at all those wires those black wires are coming off each contact leaf and eventually they find their way to a terminal board in the back of the instrument which we'll see in a moment the wires that run diagonally are for the four foot stops because the four foot registers are derived from the eight foot it's the same set of bells with different wiring but there's a whole lot of wires there and fortunately they have all remained intact. This is the junction panel where the bells are wired in. There are 61 columns, one for each note on the keyboard and a row for each of the different types of bells. There's some names that are unfamiliar like pizzicato. I think that may have been an experimental bell type that never saw the light of day. Some of the rows are labeled spare but they do correlate to a named stop tab on the front and they do bring in a set of bells, though there are a few rows here that are actually unused. 
In the back, those are the wires which lead out to the cabinets where the bells are housed. And also, all those black wires that we saw coming off the contact leaves terminate on this panel. Above it is a rail that has the connections for the stop action solenoids. Again, we see some of those unfamiliar names, probably experimental or abandoned bell types that didn't go into production. There's also a few control terminals toward the end of that panel. Now we'll move inside the console again and look at the back of the expression pedals. The expression pedals use a toothed rail to turn a gear, which then rotates the shaft of a potentiometer. Originally, the potentiometer would have controlled the brightness of a light bulb, which acted on a light-dependent resistor to provide the expression control. For my purposes, with everything being very close by and because I lacked that LDR system, I just used audio signal cable and fresh potentiometers and, and made it run straight through. Probably at some point I'll decide to rebuild the LDR system, but for now this is working fine and, and it's much simpler. On the floor we have the pedal action, including the stop action and the contact systems beneath. And then also two power supplies, one of which provides the voltage for the stop action solenoids and the other powering the tremolando system. I've mentioned the term tremolando a few times already, so let's talk about what that is. Tremolando is a technique used to provide a sustained sound on carillon. It consists of a rapid alternation between two notes, oftentimes an octave apart, like this. It can be used to provide a sustained melody over a moving accompaniment. Now, Schulmerich, in its space age ethos, decided to make the tremolando into an automatic electric function. So by holding a single key, you could reiterate either a note or a note and its octave. So I'll throw the eight and four foot Flemish bells on together, add the tremolando, just by holding a single key. Plus, there's a speed control knob. which gives you the opportunity to vary the effect. If you draw just one stop instead of two, it'll reiterate just that one octave, and of course you can vary the speed to compensate. And put the two back on together. So, a little easier than doing it manually. You have to be careful to avoid the temptation of using it all the time because it is so easy. So that's the tremolando from this side. Um, you can use it with any of the different types of bells and you can even use two different kinds of bells together. For example, I can put eight foot celesta and four foot minor tears. Let me turn this back down to slower so you can hear the different tone qualities. So you have two different kinds of bells. So you can blend things together in new ways. It's kind of fun to play with. Anyway, let me show you the inside and show you what, how it works and what I had to figure out to make it work. All right, we are looking at the swell contacts again. And when I engage the tremolando tab, you'll see that some of those sliders move. What's happening is the bus that's normally used is moving out of the way and a different bus is being engaged and there's a relay which also is part of that process. It took me a while to realize that the buses got exchanged when Tremolando was engaged and that's why when I would throw the tab 
originally it would just disable the manual because the bus was being disconnected for that manual. Once I realized the buses were switching, I was finally on my way to figuring this thing out. I had seen these terminals in the back of the console before, but finally they made sense. There was a motor-driven contact system with an arm that apparently alternated between the 8-foot and 4-foot bus. So I got some alligator clips and started experimenting and found that in fact that's exactly what the system was. So then I set out to build a prototype using whatever I could find. Here's what I came up with. It had a guitar string as the arm and the contact posts were actually just alligator clips. Uh, but it did work, so I set out to build a more robust unit and built one for the swell division and then built a second one for the grate and got those installed and they've been working ever since. And here's the unit in action. And there's the second one for the grate. They're not exactly alike. I had to use what I had, but they both work. Schulmerich's original mission was to replicate as closely as possible the sound of cast bells. But by the late 1950s and early 60s, they were expanding the palette of tone colors that could be heard in carillon music, including things like vibrato effects. Some of the Schulmerich vibrato effects were done by moving the pickups and that resulted in a blend of amplitude modulation because of the proximity of the pickups and uh, a little bit of frequency modulation because of the Doppler effect. It was a very rich sound. Some of the other Schulmerk vibrato sounds that I've heard sound more like a straight tremolo, probably done with the amplifier. Of course, the bells that were originally connected to this console did not come along with the console. So the vibrato effects were not there and the switches were there on the console, but they didn't do anything. I don't like having dead switches, so I did build a little unit to provide some kind of animation when those switches are thrown. What I ended up designing and building was a tremolo unit using a light-dependent resistor, a motor-driven shutter, and a light bulb. And that provides tremolo effect, although not vibrato effect. So even though this unit is not built in the same way the originals were, I preserved the fact that it only operates on the harp, celesta, and quadra bells. The other bells are not affected. Here's what it sounds like. These are the harp bells without the tremolo. And now with it. And on the celesta bells, and the quadra bells, or of course any combination of those, like harp and quadra together. It's not an effect I would use a whole lot. I've used it a, a few moments in a few pieces, but I just like having those switches do something. I don't like dead switches. I mentioned that the console has evolved through the years and that evolution has continued in my ownership. Um, to the right of the keyboards, there used to be a cassette recording deck, which I believe was used for recording encoding cassettes uh, for control systems. And most of it was missing and it looked terrible. So I actually removed that and replaced it with an additional speaker. I also replaced the switch plate in the center of the console because the original one had become quite warped. And actually the original one as I had it wasn't the true original because I discovered in some old photographs that where there are two switches to the left hand side at one time there were three switches. And interestingly enough if you look at the inside of the console there are stickers where those three switches were. Console, local, and distant. The console switch would have turned the system on and brought on the speakers in the playing room. Local was probably the speakers in the tower of the Schulmerk factory. As far as distant, this photograph which I took in 2002 when I visited Schulmerk's plant will give you the answer. Take a look at that water tower. 
I'll bet it's safe to assume that's the only water tower in the world that was ever driven by a few thousand watts of audio power. Although the factory is gone and there's a housing development there, the tower still stands, though without any speakers. That brings us to the end of this exploration of the console. I hope you enjoyed seeing its inner workings and also the tidbits of history that it reveals. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.